Good afternoon, and we are good afternoon, and we are live from COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. My name is Nadia Rosli, and I am project director with Internews in Malaysia and a freelance environmental journalist. This is the second last day of our live broadcast, which is brought to you by the Earth Journalism Network, a project of Internews and the Stanley Center for Peace and Security. Both of these organizations have also brought 22 journalists from developing countries to cover the 26 UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, or COP26, as part of the Climate Change Media Partnership, or CCMP program. This is an annual fellowship to the Climate Change Conference, which started in 2007, whereby the CCMP organizers believe that it is critical for journalists from low and middle income countries to have the opportunity to report live from COP26. However, with the onset of COVID, it has been more difficult than ever for journalists to attend this year because of travel restrictions. Thus, we hope this broadcast will help journalists covering COP26 remotely and serve as a resource. From November 8th until November 13th, we will be hosting this broadcast for half an hour in which every day we will touch on a different theme. We will feature three speakers, a trainer and a fellow from the CCMP program and an external speaker. And today's theme is gender and climate justice. New commitments have been made by countries and non-state actors to put gender equality at the forefront of climate action at COP26. This would see more efforts towards strengthening the resilience of women and girls in the face of climate-related impacts. To speak more on today's theme are our guests, Mildred Mulenga, CCMP trainer and senior correspondent of the Pan-African News Agency in Zambia, Maria Monica Monsalve Sanchez from Colombia, and Christian Villarreal Duran, third secretary in the Mother Earth and Water Unit of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Plurinational State of Bolivia. Uh, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please put them into the chat box and we will address them. Our first speaker is Mildred Mulenga, who is based in Lusaka, Zambia, and has over 25 years of experience in communications and journalism. She currently works as public relations and communications officer for the National De Designated Authority or NDA for the Green Climate Fund and Adaptation Fund Zambia. As a journalist, she spent nearly a decade reporting on the environment covering domestic, regional, and international issues relating to climate change for Pena Press, an African continental news agency with a presence in almost all member states of the African Union. And this is definitely not her first COP. I think she has attended more than five Yes. So, uh, so far, uh, welcome to our live broadcast. Movie. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure being here. So um, you are also a journalist, well, you know, a media trainer for a lot of the fellows this year. Uh, can you tell us more about the stories that you yourself are pursuing here at the conference? Okay. Um, as you know, there are so many stories which are being pursued here because this is an annual event uh, where um, parties or government wants to get everything uh, resolved to try to move the process forward. So one of the main, main things uh, for the African continent, which is negotiating here as an African uh, group, it's uh, on uh, climate finance, because they are saying it's this COP26. It's either it's going to break or make true for Africa, because uh, whatever the outcome it's going to be here, it's either it's going to progress the sustainable resilience actions, or it's not going to progress that. So uh, what really African governments are looking for, it's just to try and get the commitment needed for Africa. As you know, they are saying that um, Africa, it's uh, at a very vulnerable stage, and yet it's not one of the contrib major contributors of the emission. So they really want uh, climate finance to be a priority, and this is what they are trying to get out of uh, COP26. So inequalities among the parties here at um, the COP is a longstanding and also a contentious issue. So what issues on this front are you looking at and how are you reporting then to ensure that the readers understand this very politically uh, charged topics well? Okay, for instance, on um, climate uh, justice and gender, you know, one of the main issues is uh, women back home, they are, they are being neglected, they are not considered, they are left out in decision making. So we want uh, commitments from government where they are going to put women into the negotiating process during the decision making process so that they become part of it. Because you find that uh, the most vulnerable people to climate change, you find that they are women, you find that they are youth and you find the girl child. 
So what we are trying to say is, uh, you know, you can't be making decisions on behalf of the women. You can't be making decisions on behalf of these, uh, you know, girls without involving them. So we want uh, governments to recognize this, which is very important that for, for, for them to move forward with any policy they want to implement, first they must recognize the women so that they are part of those solutions. And, uh, you know, this is one of the stories I've been following up here. So what kind of unique perspectives, um, you know, do women in Zambia, especially when uh, tackling the issue of climate change, what do they have to offer on the table? Uh, what kind of examples can you give in terms of the resilience of people uh, of women in Zambia, for instance? Okay, you will find that uh, they are not lagging behind just because uh, government is not recognizing them, just because the you know the actors out there they are not recognizing them. For instance, I can give uh, an example of the issue on um, you know water. Water, it's one of the most important uh, issue in Zambia. You will find that uh, women, uh, they are the ones who go to draw water. You know, they don't have water, but at the same time, they have to draw water. At the same time, they have to feed the family. At the same time, they have to send their, school, their children to school. So I'll give an example of the, because we just had a new government in Zambia elected in August, and uh, the new president, the first image he gave when he addressed uh, the first, his first press conference, he gave us an image of saying, I want you to look at a woman who has got a baby at the back, because you know, as Africans, we like carrying our babies at the back. So I want you to have that image of a woman with a baby at the back, and then uh, dragging another child on the, right, on the right hand side, and then taking charcoal on the left hand side, and then putting water on the head. So this, these are the people government wants to pay attention to. So. And women now, you find that they're just not being left out. They are now voicing their voices so that government can behave. They are taking advantage of every fora to, to raise their voices. And then now there are so many NGOs and civil society now engaged in trying to uplift the voices of the women who are most uh, left out. Uh, that was a very powerful image of, mm -hmm. of the women that you were mentioning. Thank you for that. Um, but also we hope that you continue to amplify the voices of women in your country and also in other African states. Thank you so much. Mary. Yes, definitely. This is not the end of, of COP26. Actually, the work now starts, you know, because of these challenges which were there because of COVID and things like that. And now for COP26 to take place now. So there's just so much which can be done. And the work will definitely, Thank will you. definitely continue. Thank you so much Thank for you. having me. Thank you. So our next speaker is Maria Monica Monsalves, who has been working as a journalist for El Espectador, the oldest newspaper in Colombia for six years. Since then, she has worked alongside the section Life, covering environmental, health, and science issues. Currently, she coordinates all the environmental content of El Espectador. Welcome to the broadcast, Monica. Hi, thank you. I'm sorry I'm not wearing my mask. It's just, I just want to make sure that you understand me because uh, my uh, accent can be a little bit complicated. <laughs> uh, it's all right. I think we are all being tested here. Really. Yeah. So okay. uh, so firstly, can you just start off by telling us, um, you know, how has your first COP experience been, uh, you know, now that we're in the final hours, what are the most significant observations that you've had and the stories you've been pursuing here? So it has been pretty challenging. I have been covering environment and climate change for almost six years, but I have been doing it, you know, on ground, on ground, along communities where the actual impacts of climate change are happening. And here is another story. You now you have to be like uh, aware of the technical language that they are using, the geopolitical power of, of these conversations, of these negotiations. And so it is just, you know, a challenge. It's like basically starting from zero again. And I have found find it really hard to actually incorporate the gender issue in the negotiations. I know the Paris Agreement mentions the, the word gender in three, in three times in the preamble and in adaptation, in capacity building. But then when you go to see the actual documents or the actual negotiations, it's not something that they are you know, pursuing all the time. And gender becomes something that is around the cup. So women you know, protesting uh, outside the venue or outside the negotiations and asking like the negotiators or the delegates to actually implement gender politics in the agenda. So I had found that challenge, you know, I have, because I really want to focus in the gender issue and uh, climate change because not only because women are more vulnerable to climate change, but because sometimes they have, you know, answers or better answers uh, to how to, you know, uh, affront this crisis. So I think um, what we gather is that, you know, you have to make an intentional pursuit to look for the story yeah. or else it gets drowned 
amidst all the other like you know big high yeah, level kind of um, exactly. topics. But um, coming to that, you know, we know that women and men are experiencing climate change differently. So as a journalist from Colombia, how are you ensuring that you know the start the stories you pub you publish actually address these inequalities? Um, what are you uh, covering? You know, on the ground back home, could you tell us a bit more of that? So we have a project that is, I mean, it's not just about climate change, but we have a project that is called um, Colombianas en la Ciencia, that is women in science, like Colombian women in science. So what we try to do is, you know, like do profiles about uh, women that are researching stuff. Some of them is related to, you know, to actual environment science, environmental science. Uh, but we also try to follow, you know, like women that are leaders in their communities and that are trying to implement climate change solutions, you know? Now that I'm here, I think I'll be more aware about, you know, like always trying to search or speak with a women when we're talking about climate change issues, as again, as they are more, the more vulnerable, but also they have, you know, they, they might have like better solutions or very, better ideas of how to, you know, actual find some, you know, some solutions to these, huge issue that you know implies that all the countries are around like here trying to you know to find out how to you know affront this crisis and do you feel that there are still topics that are being underreported on on this front and what do you want to advise journalists in terms of you know topics that are worth pursuing or exploring yeah so i will advise to always think about like every time you talk about uh climate change solutions try to think about if that has a gender responsive you know, solution, basically. For, for example, in Colombia, most of the rural people is, are women, you know? And then, but these women doesn't have access to land. They don't have, you know, they don't have papers that say they own a land. And then you have a lot of, you know, organizations that, that come, you know, from outside, from Colombia and try to give them, give people from rural areas some sort of solution. So they, you know, improve the crops and they may make the crops this resilient to climate change. But then if women don't have access to land, they are not receiving any kind of money, any kind of, you know, solution. They are just, you know, they're you know, floated around. So I, I think you should do an effort to try to try to trace back how these climate solutions are impacting women around everything, not only in adaptation, because I do believe that adaptation is the one that, you know, among all the articles of the Paris Agreement and around all the climate solutions of the, the Paris Agreement, adaptation might be the one that is including more gender because it's actually there in the document, but then you should try to do it around and every, all of them, mitigation, uh, finance. I, I do believe it's really important that the money they are speaking here in these rooms, um, that is a huge topic some of it should like we we need to guarantee guarantees like make sure basically that it arrives to women uh, like down there like in the countries so are there any particular skills or, or knowledge that you have actually obtained here at cop 26 that you know you're excited to bring back home yeah for sure one of those is is this thing i'm, I'm talking about like actually like trace back if the climate sol solutions that people is talking about is are gender responsive uh, because I did do, uh, do did I did an interview, sorry, with uh, the director of an organization that is called Gender CC. So they, you know, they started years ago, like in '92, where the cops were just beginning to to start. And since then, they have been like, we have to talk about gender issues in all the climate negotiations. And they were the ones saying like, every solution has to be gender responsive in order to, you know, achieve a. a um equitable or equitative sorry um solution to climate change otherwise we will have you know carbon markets and money and a lot of solutions but yeah, they will continue to increase the inequity between women and men thank you so much monica we wish you all the best for you know all the subsequent stories that we'll be able to read from from you after this thank you so much thank you our next speaker is Christian Villarreal Duran, who has a degree in political science and public management. He is a graduate of the Master in Diplomacy and International Relations. In 2019, he set up the first COY in Bolivia as coordinator of the Bolivian Platform for Action Against Climate Change. He is 27 years old and currently works as third secretary in the Mother Earth and Water Unit of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Plurinational State of Bolivia. He's part, of the, uh, he's part of the official of his country's delegation 
in the adaptation, loss, and damage tables. Welcome to our broadcast session. Thanks, you. Too. So I think we can start. Um, you know, maybe if you could just briefly explain to us um, which negotiating block is Bolivia uh, currently representing here uh, in COP26, and what are the key demands from this block um, in terms of the, the priorities and maybe the, the main wants from this block? Yeah. Okay, the blog that Bolivia is part of is the Like-Minded Developing Countries Group, which is composed by 22 countries. And it's interesting because these are countries that all around the world, uh, we, have, uh, we are part of this uh, uh, team. Uh, China, India, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, 22 countries of all around. Uh, so many years they are changing. And this year, uh, the, the head of... Uh, the like-minded developing countries group is uh, Diego Pacheco, who's part of the Bolivian delegation. And the, pos the, the position we have as a group is always uh, common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, we, since many years ago, are buying that and constructing it. And the idea is also in this COP trying to put this uh, in, in the table. So the, um, what you mentioned earlier, it, it talks about you know, inequity uh, and can you explain more about the impacts of climate change, um, especially to women in Boli Bolivia, considering there was an annou announcement this, uh, this week that was made on, uh, in terms of gender responsive climate action. And it was announced that Bolivia will promote leadership of women and girls, especially indigenous Afro-Bolivian community and rural women through their participation in the design of sustainable development projects. Um, maybe you could uh, explain what are some of the risks and burdens faced by women in Bolivia in terms of, you know, um, going, going through the impacts of climate change? Well, being honest, uh, women in Bolivia can vote since many years ago, more than 150 years mm -hmm. ago, which is fine. But for example, indigenous people couldn't vote uh, until uh, 1945. So there is a problem because indigenous women are the, those ones who has less benefits in all the things. Anyway, we are trying to change it year by year. And for example, we have an institute, the Institute of uh, Agricultural uh, INRA, we called it. And INRA, since more than 30 years ago, is trying to keep uh, land for all indigenous people. We were doing that, and last 10 years, we had changed and saying that we are going to give uh, land to indigenous people but it has to be 50% for women, 50% for men. Mm -hmm. This is uh, something that is changing a lot because 30 years ago, it was like 90% of men. And if they uh, stop their marriages, uh, the women have to look where to stay. So right now we are changing this and this is something extremely good because uh, they are ma making new papers and the women are having more and powerful about that. About climate change, uh, we are, as Bolivia, receiving some cooperation some, some years ago uh, uh, for multilateral spaces that are making uh, efforts that women can learn more about climate change and being less, uh, with less problems about it. Uh, also, let me tell you that, um, yeah, probably you had fined with a uh, Angelica and Amelia, those are two indigenous women that are here in the Bolivian team delegation. And they are also director there in, in the plurinational um, direction of mother health. And this is something important because uh, as Bolivia, but not only as many countries, but we have that in our constitution. For us, mother health is a woman. So take care of it is the most important thing. So we are trying to make women be part of the delegation thing that you don't use, wasn't happened so many years ago. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to point out also something interesting that was made by Bolivia in the recent commitment was that uh, you, uh, the country wanted to reflect gender data in its nationally determined contributions. So in terms of the statistics, um, how will this be reflected um, in terms of the you know, environment, and gender, what, what, what kind of details will we be able to, to get from, from this uh, statistics? 50.7% of people in Bolivia is women, 
0.3% is men. So we have a little bit more women than men. It means that we should have uh, more women in this, in all these things. About the national, uh, uh, sorry, the NDCs, yeah. we didn't uh, finish it yet. We are trying to probably in three months, six months, we are gonna send it. Uh, the, the idea of the work was trying to give it, but uh, we couldn't for many reasons. COVID reasons are one of the most important uh, changes political there in our country also too. But the idea is that we are gonna uh, finish the indices and yeah, we are putting gender things there that are trying, for example, to have uh, a more women coming here in the delegations. This year we came uh, like six men and three women, and that's not fair. It's something we have to build and be better. Okay, so um, maybe you can um, comment on, you know, in your opinion, how can men actually champion for gender equality? Because I think a lot of people think that this is a cause for women only. So, uh, so yeah, what really would you like to comment about that? It's really interesting because I am checking now in the negotiations uh, co-leaders, co-chairs, and heads of delegations, and almost all of them are men. So this is something we have to start to change. Anyway, I was reading, for example, the, uh, the text that the adaptation committee sent us uh, to all the parties like one or two months ago. And one of them is saying that the adaptation committee now is composed like 70% 70, 70 of women and 30% of men. Which is awesome too. So the idea is that uh, uh, the UNFCCC has to try to make it in all uh, the committees they have, in all the groups they have, and that is gonna make that countries follows it. Because I was checking, yeah, head of delegations. It doesn't depend of the uh, of the UNFCCC. It depends of any country. And I I am checking that head of delegations everywhere are men. We have to change that hair, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Christian? Um, so someone wants to know uh, whether you have uh, you have some examples of women addressing climate change and demonstrating resilience. Once again, sorry. Uh, do you have any examples of women uh, in Bolivia addressing climate change and demonstrating resilience? Uh, yeah, as I told you, uh, the motherhood is our main idea. So we are trying to form in university uh, women for that things mm -hmm. and uh, making her go in all the rural areas and uh, changing the products we are producing for uh, this not being a part of the market, a part of community is better for us. Mm -hmm. And just uh, going back to the term resilience as well, uh, in terms of you know how Bolivia stands uh, on a lot of these issues, going back to your CBDR, uh, what do you feel um, actually defines resilience? Because I think it needs to be of uh, equal kind of uh, representation and also reflects, I guess, the historically um, contributed emissions. So maybe you can explain a bit on that. That's really complicated because in Bolivia, we have 36 kind of indigenous people. So translating resilience on all those different languages is a, a, a work that we didn't begin yet and it's a uh, something that we have to do starting for that place uh, that site we probably were able to do better things other thing i didn't tell you before is that for example we have uh, all countries have focal points of gender this is kind of new no more three years ago in each country but in bolivia for example we had decided to have a focal point we choose uh, is a young woman is a master degree which is not normal in our country but uh, she is um, the gender focal point and is not here because we are not able to bring so many people for the language. That's one reason for uh, the money, sure. So we are trying to get uh, better to start uh, bringing women here. And not only that, but as you said, it, uh, as I told you, translated things like uh, resilience to all of them being able to understand and work on it. Okay. Uh, I think we'll take one more question. Uh, what about youth movements in Bolivia? Um, sorry. So what, what drives them to the street and what is your advice to the youth? Once again, sorry. 
uh, what can you tell us more about the youth movements in Bolivia? Um, you know, what makes them go to the streets and what is your advice to youth? That's extremely complex because uh, COI, uh, Conference of Youth, in some countries, for example, I was in the uh, 14th uh, COI in Paraguay five years ago, and we created the first COI two years ago in Bolivia, and the last one is this year, the second COI. So youth in people uh, in Bolivia were not able to obtain this information, as I told you before, for the language, this is one first, I think. Anyway, uh, NGOs and many other medias uh, are uh, given inputs to young, young star organizing. So we have been, I, I, I checked because in, in my country I am young too. Anyway, I am not uh, working on that part here, but I checked the two, two young people we, we make uh, come here and yeah, being honest, people from Mexico, Brazil, Peru, brings like more than 20 young, 30 young, and countries in Europe too. So we are not able to do it yet, as I told you before, because the language is a problem, but not only that, uh, language is a problem because in Bolivia, many people speak Spanish, which is normal, but also native language. So learning three languages for us is really complex. Uh, that's something we are trying to uh, growing up. But the idea is, yeah, we had the second uh, COI, we have uh, some boys and girls that was in the first uh, pre -cups. So we are learning and trying to be in the negotiations as some countries I am checking with help of UNICEF are able to. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, it was uh, really enlightening to you know, listen from your perspective and what's happening on the ground in Bolivia. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. So thank you for joining us today. Um, if you would like to find more resources for COP26, tip sheets uh, and news published by our fellows here in Glasgow, you will be on our website, www.earthjournalism.net slash COP26. Recording of this will be available on the same website. So tomorrow is our wrap up and we hope to have fellows from Ghana, Tunisia and the Philippines to speak about their experience here. Our external speaker is Dr. Siaosi Carter speaker for the Pacific Summary. So thank you for joining us today and please be back for our final broadcast, same time and place tomorrow. Stay safe.